Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order. Uh, today being Monday, the 19th, and it's 7.02 p.m. Certainly, we want to welcome all of you that are in attendance with us this evening. Uh, if we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. Ask Councilman Brown if he would lead us in the pledge. All rise. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Present. Council Member Brown. Here. Council Member Katati. Council Member Davis. Here. Council Member Moffitt. Here. And Council Member Shule. Here. Uh, before I do the ceremonial items, I'd like to recognize uh, some guests we have here this evening. Uh, Mr. Mason E. Brooks, retired Cub Master from Emeritus, really Cub Master Emeritus, with Cub Pack number 137 from St. Joseph's AME Church, uh, passed by Reverend Dr. Owens. I'd like you to stand if you don't mind. Uh, Mr. Brooks has been working with Scouts for over 43 years, and uh, we really be commended for that. And takes it very seriously and does a great job. I see him when I'm have an opportunity to get to St. Joe's. He's always engaged, and certainly welcome you for being out here this evening. And certainly all the young men that are here with you. Uh, you certainly welcome to stay throughout our meeting. We're getting ready to start the meeting in just a few seconds. We have one proclamation to present this evening, and we'd like to ask uh, Marvin Williams, the Director of Public Works, if he would join me, please. Uh, this, this has really been a, a week for Marvin's crew, <laughs> and his people with the storms and all those things that have happened. It speaks to the fact that whereas public works services provided in our community are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives, where the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public works systems and programs such as water, sewers, streets and highways, public buildings and solid waste collection, whereas the health, safety and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services, whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities as well as their planning, design and construction is vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public work officials Whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the week of May 18th through 24th, 2014, as National Public Works Week in Durham, and hereby call upon all citizens and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing our public works to recognize the contributions which public work officials make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. With my hand, Corporal Seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the 19th day of May 2014, and I want to present this to Marvin uh, for the comments that he may have. Just really quick, thank you all for acknowledging National Public Works Week. There are several staff members in the audience tonight. I believe if they wouldn't mind standing up because these are really the people that do the work every day uh, that really goes unnoticed. <laughs> so unfortunately this week we're not going to have a lot of community service projects just because it fell on the week of end of grade testing for most schools. So we're taking this opportunity to do a lot for ourselves, uh, co-workers, service to co-workers. 
Um, so we're going to do some beautification work around the Public Works Operations Center down on MLK. And we're also going to do a lot of job shadowing this week so that the people within the different divisions can actually get, a, get some insight into what each other does on a daily basis. So it will be very beneficial to us and all of our staff to understand what we do throughout the department since we're so spread out. Um, and then we're just going to have a get together on Friday afternoon. I'd like to invite all the council members down to the operations center around lunchtime, Southern Boundaries Park, where we're just going to get together as a department for a couple hours and just enjoy each other's company. So you're more than welcome to join us. But uh, thank you again for acknowledging the work that we do on a daily basis. It is appreciated. by members of the council. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, it, that, that's, a, a, Davis. that's a perfect lead into a question I have for the manager. Uh, given the storms that we had over this past weekend, if you could just say a little bit about the staff's work. Um, I understand it was um, exceptional, but if you could just brief sure. us a little bit on that. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Moffitt. If I could, uh, I'd ask uh, Deputy Manager Bo Ferguson, who uh, oversaw both the uh, emergency response as well as the uh, recovery over the, last, over the weekend to, uh, to provide a few comments, but thank you for giving us that opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Manager, members of Council. Bo Ferguson, Deputy City Manager for Operations. Uh, thank you for recognizing the work of staff. Obviously, they prefer not to have these opportunities, but when we have them, we're uh, very proud for the service they provide. Uh, from the city's standpoint, you're, you're obviously probably mostly aware of the work that the police department and fire department do in responding to something like this, but almost immediately after the event, we had staff from Public Works, General Services, and uh, in the next day, Solid Waste, who all responded, worked really well to get the streets reopened, to get debris cleared, both uh, debris in the streets, but we also offered a, to help clear debris from uh, private property. I also know that uh, because General Services was working in the public rights of way, uh, the Parks and Recreation Department took responsibility uh, starting to get the trails cleared because as you know, uh, near the event on MLK, we've got Third Fork Creek Trail. Uh, it did uh, get closed for a short period of time because of some down trees. I would also be remiss not to mention some of the uh, partners of the city. Uh, the Sheriff's Department were on scene. Uh, County Emergency Management also played a pretty important role and uh, they activated the EOC Thursday night. Uh, and then volunteer agencies. The Red Cross did shelter two families on Thursday night. Uh, the Baptist Men's Association sent five chainsaw crews on Friday morning primarily to help uh, private property owners. So really as a group effort and obviously Duke Power uh, played a major role throughout the night, Thursday night and Friday. And Unfortunately, as you'll recall, right after the event, uh, the torrential rain continued uh, well through Thursday night, Friday morning. So all the people we just mentioned uh, were not working in ideal conditions, but uh, primarily, all the, all the streets are reopened, uh, still a lot of debris to clear up. I've been uh, working on that today, and we'll continue a little bit through the week. Thank you. And it, and it was a tornado, right? It was. It was an EF1 uh, tornado. National Weather Service came out uh, Friday afternoon and confirmed that. Well, I know I speak for everybody on staff, uh, everybody on council, in appreciating all the work that you and your various teams have done. Thank you. Well, I know uh, several of the directors are here this evening. I'll ask them to share your appreciation with their staff who all did tremendous work for this event. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd also like to uh, thank the staff members, particularly ones in the um, Durham Parks and Recreation Department, as well as other departments uh, and volunteers that uh, helped to make last weekend's Bimbe Festival a wonderful event. Um, at Rock Quarry Park. It was a wonderful location uh, made for good parking at the stadium and the music and the food and the cultural events were wonderful and I want to thank the uh, staff members for that. Also, I, I want to um, let all of us know about the wonderful um, midday program that was held um, at WNC Radio, the state of the the State of Things, the Frank Stacio program uh, today featured uh, two of our firefighters and, and emergency um, response folks along with others who talked about the whole idea of firefighting and that along with the front page article today about the 
fire truck that we are uh, saving uh, made it, a, as people might call it, a red letter day uh, for our fire department. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Comments? Recognize Councilman Mark. I'll just add on that um, I went, I was at Bimbe, and I assure your perception of that. I saw Councilman Shoulder as well. My family enjoyed it. It was a great location. Thanks. Thank you. We'll proceed with the agenda. Uh, the first item being, first priority item is by the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. No priority items this evening. Likewise, Assistant City Attorney. Uh, Mr. Mayor, no priority items. And likewise, the City Clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Okay, we'll proceed with the agenda. Uh, first item being the consent agenda. Consent agenda items may approve with a single vote uh, unless one item is pulled by a council member, a member of the audience, and we'll discuss that later in the program. Uh, the first item is approval of city, item one is approval of city council minutes. Item two is network hut license agreement between the city of Durham and Google. <coughs> Item four is amendment to existing home investment partnership agreement with Southside Revitalization Phase 1 LP in the amount of $500,000. I, I, you sure did, I apologize, Ms. Peters. And item two has been pulled. Uh, item five is renewal of urban search and rescue memorandum of agreement. Item six is compensation and classification plan recommendations. Item seven is adoption of proposed water and sewer rates for fiscal year 2014-2015. Item eight is proposed updates to fee schedule for water and sewer capital facility fees. Item nine is water reclamation facilities, master plans, engineering services contract, amendment number two. Item 10 is Turnage Heights lift station abandonment project. Item 11 can be found on the general business agenda. Item 12 through 15 are items that can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings. Entertain a motion for approval of consent agenda with exception of item two. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? <coughs> Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. We move to the general business agenda, item 11, which is proposed fiscal year 2014-2015 budget and fiscal year 2015-2020 capital improvement plan. And I'll turn it over to our city manager for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening again, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Tem Cora Cole, Cole McFadden, members of the city council, city staff, and residents of Durham, uh, both present here tonight or viewing on a Durham television network. It continues to be my honor to be entrusted to lead this great organization and over 2,400 employees committed to service within the organization and throughout the community. I am pleased to be before you this evening to officially present the proposed budget for the city of Durham for the 2014-2015 fiscal year. Over the last few years, Durham residents told us we're a city moving in the right direction. And according to the latest resident satisfaction survey, we still are. In fact, some might say we're preparing to move at the speed of light. City Council recently approved agreements for the city to work closely with two major fiber network providers to bring ultra-fast broadband to Durham. So what does ultra-fast broadband service mean? According to one of the providers, with an ultra-fast fiber-based network, information can be downloaded or shared 10 times faster than what is available to most residents in Durham now. Put another way, you can download 25 songs in one second, your favorite TV show in less than three seconds, and an online movie in 36 seconds. The impact of this latest technology is obvious for residents and businesses, and more so for the long-term economic development and investment in Durham. It quite simply lays the foundation for our community to keep mov moving forward with increased connectivity, cooperation, collaboration, innovation, and inclusion, all of which are valuable characteristics for developing a budget that meets Durham's residents' needs and continues to move our great city forward. 
No matter the provider, each has a strategic focus aimed at providing a superior product that leads to satisfied customers. Not much different from Durham's own strategic goals that support our effort of making a city that's a great place to live, work, and play. That's why Durham's strategic plan goals continue to play a major role in driving the budget process for the city. These goals are supported by programs and services measured to ensure that resources are used effectively with budget decisions based on reliable data that show whether programs are meeting the needs of our residents. The continued prioritization of programs aligned with strategic plan goals demanded that budget priorities and new programs clearly support improving the city's economy, community, neighborhoods, management, or its infrastructure. For the past few months, the city has worked closely with the fiber providers, learning their needs and what is required from the city to move gigabit broadband service from an idea to reality. Installing thousands of miles of fiber throughout the city is a huge construction project and as you might imagine, it's not a simple task that should be undertaken without a lot of advanced planning. Planning that included the city sharing volumes of information about existing infrastructure and processes, all to get ready for construction when the hard work begins. And we know the work can be inconvenient, but it is worth it in the end. We learned that preparing for ultra high speed internet can be quite similar to the steps the city takes to prepare our annual budget. One provider called it their fiber ready checklist, which includes providing information about the city's existing infrastructure, helping to ensure access to existing infrastructure, and making the construction process speedy and predictable. We'll refer to our preparation as our budget ready checklist, which includes gathering information. In other words, what are our revenues and costs and how do they support residents' needs and desires? Creating and sustaining and facilitating partnerships and implementing high quality services and programs. In the past years, we listened to elected officials and residents in many different ways as we prepared the budget, as in the past years. I do would like to take this opportunity to thank the mayor and the city council for their guidance and participation from the very beginning of the budget process and the residents who made their voices heard as well. Each budget continues to be a collaborative process that cannot be done well without the input of the council and the public. With any major project, you must know what your resources are and understand what factors influence them short and long term. In working with the fiber providers, we provided them with information about our infrastructure and processes. So our budget checklist item number one, gather information. What are our revenues and costs and how do they support residents' needs and desires? As always in developing our budget, we look at our overall resources financial and human, to understand available resources needed to sustain a well-managed city, including the cost of services, adequate resources to provide them, including fair and reasonable tax rates, along with re responsible debt ratios, bond ratings, and reserves. We also look at the potential impact of the state legislative decisions on our budget. The proposed total budget for fiscal year 2014-15 is $386.7 million, an increase of $10.2 million, or 2.7% from last year. The proposed general fund budget, which covers most of the city's core services, is $173.6 million, a 2.3% increase from last year. This budget represents slight increases in property and sales tax revenues and decreases in business license revenues, inspection and planning fees, due to the completion of several large commercial projects. This year, I am recommending an increase of 1.29 cents in the tax rate to 58.04 cents per $100 of assessed value. The owner of a $150,000 home would pay a total of $870.60, an increase of $19.35 per year. This includes a 0.73 cent increase per $100 of assessed value for voter approved debt service costs and a 0.56 cent in the general fund to pay for pay and benefits for 16 police officers and 15 firefighters whose salaries had been covered by grants that recently expired. The table shows how the property tax will be allocated to cover property tax supported city expenses. Overall sales tax and state collected revenues are expected to increase 
by almost $1.8 million, or a little over 3%. It will be important to closely monitor these revenue sources throughout the year as a result of the changes brought about by the tax reform legislation approved by the General Assembly last year. Proposed general fund expenditures include increases in personnel and transfers and a decrease in operating expenditures. The economy continues to rebound, but slowly. As a result, we continue to scrutinize programs and services and limit any increases to what is needed to accommodate population growth and other cost factors and also to support our strategic plan. This year, departments also eliminated about $1.6 million from their budgets to help close the gap between projected revenues and expenditures. The proposed budget continues to meet our general fund balance reserve policies, and that is projected to be at 13.5%. The proposed budget also uses $440,000 of fund balance for one-time expenditures. The city continues to enjoy an outstanding credit rating by all rating agencies. The debt ratio in the budget this year is projected to be 14.66%, which is below the budget guideline of 15%. Our commitment to being a well-managed city includes rewarding employees who are committed to excellence, creativity, and service. According to the most recent resident satisfaction survey, eight in 10 residents say our employees are courteous and easy to contact. I am pleased to announce that after several years, we are recommending the city to return to a differentiated pay for performance system. Rewarding employees who perform at a high level is a top priority. Employees will receive an average 3% pay increase, while police and fire pay plans will continue at an average of 3.5% pay increase. We're also happy to say that we don't project a change in health insurance due to great performance by the city's self-insured health plan, including employee wellness initiatives. A moderate 5% increase is projected in our, our self-insured dental insurance program in the proposed budget. Budget checklist item number two, create, sustain, and facilitate partnerships that benefit Durham residents. Over the past few months, we've learned a lot of new terms as we've prepared for the possibility of entering the gigabit world. Terms like fiber hut, quite literally little huts that house the fiber connections that can reach out to as many as 20,000 homes. When I think of the role of government, this checklist item reminds me of our charge to initiate and facilitate partnerships that help us achieve many of our strategic goals. At the same time, we strive to reach out to distressed communities and areas to ensure that everyone, no matter where they live, work, or play, can be a part of our community's success. We continue our strong collaborations throughout the community to continue to stabilize and grow the economy, partnering with the Durham Chamber, our great universities, Durham County, Durham Public Schools, and Downtown Durham Incorporated. The city will continue to provide resources that help businesses create jobs, recruit and retain employees, and even help businesses get their footing. Earlier this year, city and county managers embarked on an initiative to develop a joint strategic economic development plan. While the level of community interest in this joint strategic plan has been high, only some progress has been made to date. While there is no immediate budgetary impact, to propel the Durham economy forward, it is essential that the elected leadership of the city and the county and city and county management make completing and approving a joint economic strategic plan by the end of the calendar year a high priority. The city will also continue its partnership with Durham County to fund programs that benefit both county and city residents. Here's a list of the many joint initiatives that serve our community. At this time, I'd like to extend a special welcome to new County Manager Wendell Davis. I, along with city staff, look forward to working with him and to continuing our strong partnership with Durham County. You need only drive downtown to see uh, evidence of growth and revitalization in the community. Business improvement grants are proposed to continue for the Paris Street and 9th Street areas to support this revitalization. And last year, Durham stepped up its already cool art scene. After a year of planning, the Art of Cool Jazz Festival burst onto the scene, attracting thousands and injecting nearly a half a million dollars into our economy over one weekend. The first annual Bull City Sculpture Show began earlier this month and will bring thousands to Durham over the next six months. 
Installed throughout downtown, it includes 12 new works by artists from all over the country, six of them from North Carolina. It's possible in part through a $10,000 grant from the Office of Economic and Workforce Development and a contribution from the Durham Cultural Advisory Board. Supporting the arts is essential to Durham's economy and I recommend that we continue our funding of the arts as shown. Now turning to neighborhoods, which in a way serve to connect us all to our community and to our city. Neighborhoods are our home base and our goal is to make each one thriving and livable. The city is working to support and achieve Mayor Bell's challenge of reducing poverty one neighborhood at a time. During next week's budget presentations, department directors will highlight programs that support reducing poverty in Durham's neighborhoods, in particular Census Tract 10.01. To that end, the city continues to take a holistic approach to helping Durham's most distressed neighborhoods. The penny for housing will continue to address many affordable housing needs. If you've driven by Southside lately, you know how much a difference a year makes. 132 rental units are nearing completion and 19 of the 48 available lots for single family homes have already been reserved. Planning for phase two rental and home ownership is also underway. While other efforts also ramp up this year that sharpen our focus on creating thriving neighborhoods, I'm excited that the city with the support from a $96,000 grant from HUD will conduct an extensive fair housing training and outreach this year to the Latino community. We've talked about vacant and boarded houses for many years now, and we've made progress toward bringing those, many of those unsafe and deteriorating properties up to code. We found 502 of those properties in 2011, and we're projecting that number, which is now at 150, to be only about 75 by the end of next fiscal year. Code enforcement will continue through the proactive rental inspection program and we need lot cleanup efforts. Many residents attended events aimed at encouraging healthy living and just getting to know your neighbor, including Thanksgiving and spring in both cities play streets. We'll continue to support efforts like these. Working with our partner Triangle Transit Authority to improve our transit system to meet resident expectation continues to be a priority. Funding from the new half cent sales tax increase and a $7 motor vehicle registration fee began in 2013 and has helped increase frequency as well as alleviate overcrowded routes. Improvements to bus stops, facilities, and security are planned for the coming year. Solid Waste Collection is a service that consistently maintains high rankings in resident satisfaction. Despite that, it's an area in which revenues don't support the service to our more than 80,000 households. Last year, in a move to more clearly define solid waste costs and to adequately fund capital needs, such as heavy equipment and collection trucks, the Solid Waste Fund was created and a capital recovery fee of $1.80 per month began. Despite these changes, the Solid Waste Fund this year will require a general fund subsidy of more than $9.6 million. Although additional fee increases to shore up some of the operating costs were necessary, as shown on the slide, other operational efficiencies were also needed. I'm proposing a reduction in code enforcement and that it be done on a reactive basis when residents inform us of a need, enabling the department to eliminate two positions. Also, while waste reduction continues to be an important effort to encourage recycling and waste diversion, this activity will be absorbed by other positions within the department. Rest assured, we remain committed to providing a high quality of solid waste services to our residents despite these necessary reductions. Nowhere in the city are partnerships more vital than our work to keep our community safe and secure. As warranted, this area uses the greatest share of city resources and personnel as well as facilities and equipment. Reducing crime remains a high priority for our city. And while we recognize that crime rates do fluctuate from quarter to quarter and year, year to year, no number of homicides, assaults, and other violent crimes is acceptable. All sworn positions are fully funded in the police and fire departments, including previously granted grant funded positions as shown on the slide, and vital life-saving equipment is also funded for both departments. As pointed out last year, Durham's underfunded criminal justice system continues to burden city resources next year by over $250,000. And while supporting these efforts is crucial for our community at this time, it forces the city to reprioritize resources 
to subsidize the state criminal justice system in Durham with funds that could be used for other local crime fighting needs. This budget provides funding to support a domestic violence judge, witness victim legal assistance, and a gang assistant district attorney. We also continue, will continue our partnership with Durham County to help redirect youth from gangs. Budget checklist item number three, implement programs and services that are efficient, effective, and high quality. This checklist item is where reality sets in. We're putting our programs and services into action to make a difference in the lives of Durham's residents. In addition to programs, taking care of the infrastructure of the city is crucial for our future. For that reason, we continue to keep maintenance at the top of our priority list. The city has made significant strides to commit funding over the past few years to address longstanding infrastructure maintenance deficiencies. The proposed budget does not include any additional funds for parks and recreation facilities maintenance. However, during the budget workshops next week, staff will present a plan to enhance maintenance quality, which if approved would require an additional half cent tax increase above what is recommended in the proposed budget. City Council has already considered the rate increases for water and sewer fund with an average of 3% rate increase that will generate about $1.4 million for ongoing maintenance of water lines and other infrastructure. Also to, commit, to continue meeting stringent environmental challenges for Jordan and Falls Lakes, stormwater rates will need to increase about 7.5% for customers. While we've come a long way over the past few years, the conditions of our streets continues to be a concern for our residents. According to our most recent res uh, resident satisfaction survey, I'm proposing that in addition to $400,000 for sidewalks, the street repaving funding be increased this year to $1 million in the proposed budget. A new position is also proposed to be funded in the Public Works Department to support street sidewalk and bike lane uh, project enhancement to, uh, project delivery. Capital improvement project funds are also budgeted for much needed parks improvements, including ADA upgrades, field, and court repairs. You'll see some of the other major capital improvement projects listed here totaling more than $93 million for current and new projects. These projects are funded through fees, water and sewer revenues, revenue bonds, and other financing. In our effort to improve transparency, funds are, are proposed budgeted for an upgraded Web 2.0 that improves two-way communications with residents, including mobile apps and social networking. We're also excited about a joint city-county open data project to foster open, transparent, and accessible government by sharing data freely. At this point, we've done our best thinking to deliver a budget that propels the city forward. It has been a collaborative process, assessing resources, trying to predict, relying on data and past experiences, what the immediate future holds, relying at all times, while at all times considering the long-range implications of budget decisions. I'm confident that this budget has all the benefits that being a gigabit fiber community offers. It's collaborative, it's forward thinking, it's inclusive, it's strategic, it's innovative, affordable, and most importantly meets the needs of a city that is headed in the right direction. And now, some might say, even at the speed of light. It's a little wonder there's great excitement and anticipation about fiber coming to Durham. Just as with fiber possibilities, your thoughts about the 2015 budget are important. And while you might not be able to send your suggestions and comments at the speed of light, you can get them to City Hall by email on the city's Facebook page or Twitter feed, and even by video submission on the city's YouTube channel. So here's your chance to tell us what you think. Then we'll respond to your comments and answer any questions as we can during our second annual E-Town Hall event on Monday, June 2nd, which will be aired live on Durham Television Network and live streamed on the city's website. In addition to our E-Town Hall event, there are other ways that you can let us know your thoughts about the budget. Copies of the preliminary budget are available on the city's website, in the city clerk's office, and in the management, uh, budget and management services department. As always, special recognition and thanks go out to the budget and management services director, Bertha Johnson, and her entire budget staff, as they provide superior leadership to ensure that our strategic plan guides as well as aligns with the city's budget priorities. Thank you, Bertha. I continue to appreciate and value the close working relationship between the mayor, city council, and city administration, and say that now that our preliminary checklist is done, 
let's work together on the proposed budget to get up to speed. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, as usual, you've done a great job of setting us on a path, as you indicated. Uh, we really start to work on Wednesday, May 28th, when we begin to sit down and go through the proposed budget uh, and try to shape a budget that hopefully we can all be comfortable with. Uh, this is a, not a public hearing, but it is an opportunity for persons who may want to speak on what's been presented uh, to do so. And I'm going to recognize uh, Victoria Peterson, who has signed up. I don't know if it's anyone else that has signed up that wanted to speak on this item. If not, uh, Ms. Peterson, you have uh, three minutes if you come to the podium to the right. Can I, I'd like to <laughs> talk to the city council members. Can somebody Let me see if I can use my muscles. <laughs> I used to lift weights and run track years ago, so I must still have it. Uh, Mr. Mayor and city council members, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to have a few minutes here. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about one issue, but I decided I want to talk about something else. And thank you, Mr. Bonfield, for, uh, for your report. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that the city's trying to bring fiber to this community. I have spoken about fiber optic for quite a few years. But one of the problems that the city still has is our crime problem. We've got to address the crime problem in this community. And lately, over the last several months, council members, I have gotten numerous phone calls, numerous phone calls on citizens here in Durham, who family members are lingering in the Durham County Jail. And they are there because our police force has gone around in this community arresting persons who are innocent, throwing them in the Durham County Jail, and they are basically have been left there. We have persons from this city that our tax dollars are paying for the police force, thousands and thousands of dollars of individuals who are lingering in our county jail. And there's a serious problem in this community, and I know I'm gonna get in trouble for what I'm gonna already say now, with some of our attorneys, our attorneys who are supposed to be working, working with the indigent, they are not doing their job. There should be no reason in this community that a citizen in Durham City goes to jail, stays in jail close to a year, and they have only had one court date. Now, I know the city may say, well, Mrs. Peterson, that's not our issue. That's the Durham County. The, the jail is run by the county. The court system is run by the county. But it starts with the city. It starts with our police force. I want us to have a good police force. I have a criminal justice background. But we have to make sure that our police force is not going into the poor communities, just arresting any old body. So the numbers will look good. So when people come here and give their report, they give you the impression that crime is going down in Durham. I've said it numerous times over the years, crime is not going down in Durham. We have a serious crime problem in this community. And now on top of that, we're going out, we are arresting folks, keeping them in jail. Some of them are losing their jobs, they have lost their apartments, and some of them even dealing with childcare. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm asking that some of the dollars uh, can I you, at least you, finish no, my you, statement? You, you allowed three minutes. All right, can I finish my I thought you were going to speak on the budget, but you yes. swayed away from that. So I'm, I'm going to ask you. No, you I would want to no, just no, say no, money. I'm, I'm about we, we heard you. We heard you. You oh, had three okay. minutes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's move to the next item. We'll move into a.
public hearing. And the first item is item 12, Unified Development Ordinance Text Amendment, Tree Coverage Calculations. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of Council, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Um, I'd first like to certify for the record that all public hearing items before you tonight have been advertised in accordance with the requirements of law and there are affidavits to that effect on file with the Planning Department. Um, the item before you, TC 130002, uh, is a proposed text amendment regarding tree coverage calculations. Um, Council first heard this request at the February 3rd meeting and it was continued until tonight's uh, meeting, May 19th. Um, the applicant has asked, uh, recently requested that the, this item be referred back to the administration for additional modifications. So we would request that the uh, public hearing be closed and that the item be re referred back to the administration. Um, the applicant has expressed his intent to make modifications, uh, coordinate with staff, and it, it will be reprogrammed uh, for a future meeting with uh, new notifications, the cost of which will be borne by the applicant. I'll be happy to take any questions. All right, this is a public hearing matter. The public hearing is open. We've heard the staff recommendation, but before we move further, I would ask are there any comments by members of the council on this item? Uh, is there anyone in the public that wants to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the public asked to speak on this item. I would encourage the public hearing to be closed. Matter of fact, for the council. You've heard the staff recommendation. I'd entertain a motion to accept the staff recommendation. Been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Next item is item 13, consolidated annexation item, the corners at Briar Creek Initial. Good evening again, Mr. Mayor, members of Council, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, before you is the uh, requested consolidated uh, an utility extension agreement, annexation, and initial zoning item for the corners of Briar Creek, which is a uh, proposed annexation of approximately 123.5 acres at the northern corner of T.W. Alexander and U.S. Highway 70. Uh, and the recommendation, uh, the request is to uh, grant the utility extension agreement, um, which has been reviewed by the Public Works and Water Management Department, which found that at the proposed um, density associated with this action, which would allow up to 141 single family homes or a place of worship, uh, there would be uh, no negative utility impacts and that there are adequate water and sewer capacity uh, in the area to serve the pr proposed project. Uh, a voluntary petition for annexation has been submitted. The Budget Management Services Department has reviewed that and determined that uh, uh, in, for a fiscal impact analysis and determined that at the proposed density, the project would be revenue positive following annexation. Uh, and finally, uh, if the annexation is approved, initial zoning would have to be applied by the city. Uh, staff is recommending that initial zoning of rural residential or RR be uh, applied to the property. Um, the, ap uh, the applicant in this case has expressed interest in uh, a subsequent uh, zoning to a higher density at a later date, and that would, that would appear before you later. This item would allow uh, the RR density to be applied in a maximum of 141 single family units to be developed. Uh, staff recommends council uh, approve the extension agreement, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning uh, for this project. I'll be happy to take any questions. You have heard the uh, staff report. This is a public hearing. I would ask other questions by members of the council. Uh, if not, we have one person that has signed up to speak, Patrick Biker. Uh, why Patrick is coming, is there anyone else who wants to speak on this item? All right, Patrick. Good evening, yeah, Mayor. Yeah, five minutes in I don't even need that, sir. Good evening, Mayor Bell, members of the City Council. My name is Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm here tonight with Tommy Craven, uh, who's our project engineer. We represent the development team working on the corners of Briar Creek. Uh, we're just here tonight to say thank you very much for your time and to answer any questions that you may have about this project that's primarily in Wake County. Thank you. Any questions of the developer? Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Close the public hearing first. Is, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item? If not, let the record reflect no one has asked to speak. I'll close the public hearing. Matt is back before the council. Mr. Staff Mayor, person very, has a comment. if I might, I'm sorry to interrupt very quickly. Um, there was a uh, Scrivener's error in attachment 11, which is the proposed order for the annexation, identifying the date of tonight's hearing as the 18th. So that's been corrected uh, in on base to the 19th. I just wanted to make that for the record. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. I'll move the item. It's been properly moved and second. Any further questions? If not, 
Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. Passes seven to zero. Let, let me make a comment on this item. Uh, and uh, Patrick, you, you may want to speak to that. Uh, I'd had some discussions with Patrick earlier uh, about this particular item. And uh, it's an item that may require further action either over in Raleigh the City Council or it may require action over in the General Assembly. And what I said to Patrick, uh, if it, something you decide needs to go to the General Assembly, I told him we have a meeting with our local delegation, uh, when is it? The Friday. Friday. Mm -hmm. And uh, he will be welcome to come and explain to them. So why don't you go ahead and speak to it if you don't mind. Thank you, Mayor Bell. Yes, uh, our, our team has put together, or our client has put together this property, about 120 some acres, as Mr. Young stated, uh, over uh, 10, 15 years or more. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the annexation agreement that Durham and Raleigh entered into, uh, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, the fact is it was entered into before T.W. Alexander went across uh, US 70 Glenwood Avenue. And when that happened, uh, and that road was extended, it created three very small uh, parcels that total 1.07 acres, which are in the city of Raleigh's jurisdiction. So out of the 123 acres uh, in the project, uh, we have a very small uh, percentage of it in Raleigh, and we're trying to work through that. Mr. Young's been very diligent to uh, set up a meeting with uh, Raleigh planners. We hope we can get that done administratively, but if there's a conflict between the two ordinances, then I met with Senator Mike Woodard, and it may be something that the General Assembly takes a look at during this short session. So that's where it stands right now, and again, be happy to answer any questions. Do you think it will be necessary for you to attend our meeting? Will you have it worked out before then? Because if, if, if it's something that's going to require action, we've got our local delegation there, and if it's a local act, if all yeah. the delegation is in agreement, at least right. on our side, it works. Right. Uh, it won't be worked out by the 23rd, but so we'll, we'll attend the meeting, but we'll just have to keep pushing ahead and hopefully get it all worked out in the, in the f next few weeks. All right. Fine. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, the next item is item 14, Unified Development Ordinance, Text Amendment, Watershed Protection Overlay, Rural Village, TC 13000003. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor, members of Council, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, this text amendment is a proposed text amendment to Article 8 of the Unified Development Ordinance, which would uh, affect regulations that pertain to lot size and impervious surface limits within the rural vi village of Rougemont, which is located, um, as I think you all are well aware, entirely within the county's jurisdiction, so there'd be no direct impact uh, within city limits. This is being brought to you tonight to ensure consistency between the county adopted version and the city adopted version of the UDO. The uh, county recently adopted this um, item on a unanimous vote, um, and the Planning Commission recommended approval uh, by a vote of 12 to 0 at its February 11, 2014 uh, meeting. So again, this pertains only to uh, lot size and impervious service limitations within the Rougemont Rural Village, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Again, this is a public hearing item. The public hearing is open. You've heard the staff report. Are there questions by members of the council and the staff? Uh, is anyone in the audience that wants to speak on this item that's being a public hearing? Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the audience has to speak. I would declare the public hearing to be closed. Madam Speaker, before the council. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Uh, the final public hearing item is item 15 adoption of proposed stormwater rates for fiscal year 2015. Good evening, Mayor Bell and Council. Paul Weepke, uh, Department of Public Works. The City of Durham Stormwater Fund supports repair, operation, and maintenance of publicly owned stormwater systems within the city and funds programs that protect water quality as required by the city's NPDES National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit and various state regulations, including nutrient management strategies. Current rates for all residential tiers and non-residential use are middle of the pack when compared with benchmark cities that have stormwater fees. The proposed increase of 7.5% supports increased capital funding for stormwater retrofits to comply with the Falls Lake Stage 1 existing development requirements. This increase is 1% lower than was anticipated at this time last year. Customer bill impacts will average annually for Tier 1 residential less than 2,000 square feet of impervious an annual increase of $2.76 for Tier 2 residential from 2,000 to 4,000 square feet of impervious surface, an annual increase of $5.64. And for those residents with impervious surfaces of greater than 4,000 square feet, their annual increase will be 
$11.28. All non-residential customers will have an annual increase of approximately $110 per year. In order to continue retrofit program development in the Falls Lake watershed while maintaining required activities associated with our National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit, the staff recommends adoption of a stormwater rate increase of 7.5% effective July 1. Okay, again, this is a public hearing. Uh, you've heard the staff report on this item. I would again ask that our questions by members of the council. If not, is there anyone in the public that would like to speak on this item? Let the record reflect no one else in the public wanted to speak on this item. I'll declare the public, public hearing to be closed. Madam back before the council. Move that. Second. It's been moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Uh, we'll move back to consent agenda item number two, which is pulled by Ms. Peterson. Ms. Peterson, you have three minutes on this item. If you go to the podium to the right. Item two is network hut license agreement between the city of Durham and Google. Yes, if this project really goes off well here in the city uh, to bring fiber to the homes, I really would like to know about how many homes that they're speaking about bringing the fiber to. Also, they're also looking at using some of the city property. When you read the report or their proposal, um, it does not mention what city property that they are planning to use. Um, fiber is an awesome industry, bringing fiber optic to, to the commercial buildings as well as the residential homes. It's a booming business around the country. But if it's not done right, it's going to really pass Durham residents and Durham citizens. They will be able to get the service but they will not really be able to generate the income from, um, to help build it, to bring the economic development dollars to our community. And what I would like to see the city to really share a little bit in more information to the public tonight on how many of our young men in this community who linger in poverty and the mayor is on the uh, 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 a project trying to, with the city manager, trying to uplift our people who live in poverty in this community, trying to get them job training and skills. I would really like to know how this project is really going to help our citizens get employment. I do know that Durham trained over 200 and some young men in this community and women a few years ago in the areas of copper cable and fiber optic. But after a lot of them were trained, a lot of the companies would not hire them because they were felons. But if they actually lay the fiber outside of the buildings, they can get employment because some companies will hire them for that. But when it comes for them to actually uh, bring the fiber, not just to the wall of the building, but bring the fiber inside of the building or bring the fiber inside of the home, a lot of companies will not hire persons who have criminal records. I've been in this industry for a long time. I know this industry a little bit. And so I'm glad, I'm happy that we're going to bring fiber to this community, hoping that this project will go off. But I do have some concerns, unless the city really put something in place to encourage these companies to hire our local folks. Again, a project a, a lot of our local people will not be able to benefit from this project. The homes and the residents will, but when it comes to the jobs, to employment, Mr. Mayor, and the city manager and city council, I'm very concerned about that. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. I, I'm not so sure we're at the point where we can answer those questions that you, you've answered, but you can be assured that if, in fact, we're fortunate enough to get one of these projects, Eagle Google or what at and is proposing, and it requires city support, uh, there'll be strong emphasis to try to make sure that uh, local persons are employ employed, and hopefully with some, pe some of the people that you've identified will also be a part of that. So just stay tuned. We can't give you any more than that, and we'll give you, but thanks for your comments. Move the item. Uh, it's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? 
to close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Any other items to come before the council tonight? If not, we're adjourned at 7.56 p.m. Thank you.